Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to episode number 11 of Sorry We're Closed. We're off to a hot start here. 11 episodes in. Number 10 was the best episode we've ever had. Uh, my my dear friend, Jared Carabas came on and it was a tremendous episode, our longest episode, um, but it, it showed what kind of what I want this podcast to be, which is a podcast that ultimately doesn't have uh, a niche you know it's not it's not just a baseball podcast it's not just you know you know whatever or a drinking podcast you know I do that as well but it's a podcast where we can kind of go anywhere uh, it's kind of my take on the Joe Rogan show in the sense that you know you can have anyone on it can't doesn't it just have to be you know baseball people or it doesn't have to just be this you know it has a little bit of everything so you know that was a great episode to have in my first double digits double digits episode however Today we have another good one. Uh, No guests, just me today. But I'm calling this the 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 fall of Pat Light, the rise and fall. I guess Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about my career and and how it kind of all fell apart. And you know, this is something I don't think I've ever talked. I've talked. I've talked uh, briefly about it in public, but never uh, extensively. And I think that's what we're going to get into today. So here we go. Um, it, it was 2012. Uh, I got drafted in 2009 out of high school. Um, you know, had uh, my freshman sophomore year didn't go so well. Didn't play at all on the baseball team. Was made it, but barely, I assume, because we I didn't play at all. And uh, for whatever reason, was able to get you know a, a chance, a look at varsity my junior year, and. You know, I had three or four guys. I want to say it was four guys, uh, all go down and down with injuries before opening day. And I remember I had one guy on the team. I'm not going to mention him by name, but I had one guy on the team who literally told me. You know, I was in. The, I was put into this group. We had these PFP groups, and I was put into this group that uh, was you know the starting rotation. You know, the guys and a couple of guys had already gone de- gone down. And so I was put into this group, and this guy literally told me it's high school, so I get it. But like he literally told me that the only reason I was in this group was because you know so and so got hurt, and I was like, I mean, I was a young, I was you know junior, and I was a young guy, you know, I, I hadn't established myself, and I just kind of, I was like, okay, yeah, like whatever, man, like, and you know, just kept doing my thing. Lo and behold, everyone else goes down with injuries too, and I'm the only one left standing, so I'm the opening day starter for the team. And, you know, I, you know, it was kind of shocking, but, you know, whatever, up to the challenge, right? So, start opening day, win the game, get a W. Actually, I might have got no decision that day, I can't remember, but we get the win. And literally from that point on until my end of my senior year, I didn't lose a game. I went 20-0 uh, and ended up getting drafted in the 28th round, 852nd overall, because I never forget those things, uh, by the Minnesota Twins. Really shoved up that guy's ass, huh? Uh, tell me, I'm, I'm, I'm no. But he ended up coming back from injury and you know being a scrub. But uh, couldn't believe he said that. Like how, like even in high school, I wasn't a mean person. Like I don't understand how people just say those things. It's definitely just insecurity on their own end. Um, this guy sucked and continued to suck. So he never played college ball. But you know, screw him, right? Anywho, moving on. So then we go to college. I turned down the the pick out of high school. I actually had a guy, uh, the the scout who was the one who drafted me for the Twins, actually come to my house and tell me that he would be considered the best the best draft uh, the best um, scout of all time if he got the um, selection. And I got I actually signed because it was ridiculous for me to sign at that point. But you know, he actually called me and told me I think it was you know I deserved to be drafted. So that is why. Um, that happened. So it was good. It was nice. I appreciated it. And uh, yeah, I was actually playing Mario Kart down in my basement uh, at the time of being drafted. And my parents were watching. I wasn't even watching. But I might move on. So I ended up going uh, to Monmouth University, a small school, uh, which ended up being an absolute blessing. And if I give any words of wisdom to any young baseball player, player out there, it is to 1,000% go to a place you can play, especially in baseball. I can't speak for the other sports. But for baseball, you got to go to somewhere you can play uh, because that ultimately is what's going to get you drafted. You know, my, my, my freshman year at Monmouth, you know, came in as this big time. First guy ever to get drafted out of high school and turn it down to come to Monmouth. Um, small school, obviously. And, you know, first guy ever to do that. So, you know, there's you know, a little bit of, uh, you know, who is this guy type of deal, all that good stuff, right? So I show up, 
go two and six with a six one two ERA uh, my freshman year. Absolutely get torched um, and out of my league. You know, did not pitch well. And uh, you know, obviously tough year, hated the year, and you didn't live up, live up to expectations, right? And you know, whatever, it sucked. Go into my my sophomore year, you know, I get off to another slow start. And end up recovering after my the second half of my my sophomore year, and end up going a little bit of a run, finish 500. Um, and uh, we, I don't think we had that good of a team that year. We had a worse team my freshman year, but not that good of a team that year. So you know, nothing ever came of it. But I end up pitching that last year. My last, I love the senior class, the older class that I had, and. My last appearance that year was uh, uh, to keep us in alive in the conference tournament, and threw 152 pitches, and complete game, won the game. Really ballsy move by my 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 by me, you know, no big deal. But it was you know it was a big a big stepping stone for me going into that summer, uh, which would be in the Cape Cod Baseball League, which obviously obviously everyone knows it's a baseball fan, that that is you know, where you want to be going into your, your junior year, the year that you're going to get drafted, because that's where every scout, every agent is known to man to be there, right? So I get up there. I'm actually driving on the way up there. I have a temp contract. To, you know, they give temp contracts out in the Cape because a lot of guys that are on the team um, are playing the College World Series, and they come later. So they give temp contracts out to smaller school guys that want to come up. So that they they are able to play in the Cape Cod Baseball League, but you know they end up leaving you know a month in or so when all the big dogs come in. So I was given a temp contract, and then on my way up there, I actually get a phone call from the team, and uh, I you know they said, hey, listen, we're going to offer you a, a uh, you know full contract now to play for the whole season. I was like, awesome, that's great news. Um, you know, you can play the whole summer in Chatham. You know, be Freddie Prince Jr. Right, and you know we got guys like you know uh, Chris Bryant on my team. Uh, I actually don't think we had, we had you know Stephen Perez who was a good shortstop out of Miami, uh, but I don't think we ended up having anyone else on that team that was oh Buck Farmer who's still pitching in the big leagues with Detroit. Uh, I can't remember who else, but you know some good players, right? And uh, and it was it was it, I mean it was it was crazy. It was uh, the first time for especially a Monmouth guy to ever make it that far and be at be at a, at a school like that or not a school at, as a at a team like that with guys from UCLA, guys from Georgia Tech, guys from you know like San Diego's where Chris Bryant went. You know every big name known to man and playing against these guys. Awesome experience, absolutely awesome experience, and. I was a starter in the beginning, got absolutely crushed. They moved me to a reliever, and that's where I kind of got put on the map. Uh, I did really well as a reliever, threw the ball you know, hard, mid, mid to upper 90s, and that's kind of where everything started coming together for me and where I started getting put on the map as possibly a first-round draft pick. Um, that's obviously exciting for any kid. Uh, and it was an exciting summer. I didn't have great statistics out there, but from the from a reliever standpoint, I did throw pretty well. I did, did have some pretty good statistics, so... Uh, it was cool, um, but moving on, my going into my my soft my junior fall, I get uh, you know scout day where all thirty teams show up. You know the Yankees guy comes up to me, tells me that, or actually the Mariners guy at the time came up to me and tell me you know the only reason these guys are here is for me. Cool feeling. Glad he did that away from my teammates, but cool feeling. Um, end up having a great year, throwing the ball really well. Get drafted thirty seventh overall by the Red Sox, and you know. Living the dream, right? First year, get torn, torn my hamstring, not great, whatever. Again, Salem, Virginia, high A, my second year, 2014. You know, do okay as a starter. Spring training rolls around 2015. And um, there's definitely some rumors here about, you know, the direction. So, you know, in your third year, you have the Rule 5 draft coming up, which means that you have to either be put on the 40-man or let another team have a shot at you in the Rule 5 draft pick. Now, I am a hard-throwing guy, haven't. You know, haven't really had a chance at relieve as a reliever yet, but you know, going to get you know, it looks as though I'm a prime candidate based off my agent at the time, who was Scott Boris. My I was a prime candidate for the Rule Five Draft and would pro- would almost 1,000 percent get selected. So we have a pretty good idea that the Red Sox will put me on the 40 man roster at the end of the year, but it's all depending on my year in in uh, 2015. So. Start off, first relieving appearance, go to double A, right? First time ever being at double A, kind of nerve-wracking, different 
different atmosphere, different uh, different uh, setting, you know, different type of baseball. And Double A has always been told it's like the first time you really start seeing big leaguers. Uh, so it's a tough, it's tough, tough, you know, brand of baseball. So first one I pitch against, uh, I don't remember where they're from, but it's the Double A team for the Phillies, and I absolutely get torched. Uh, give up, you know, like three home runs, like don't do well at all, right? And then I go and, you know, from then on, pretty much absolutely lights out for two months. Just absolutely crush double A. And get promoted at the end of May, early June, to triple A Pawtucket. Uh, excited. I'm one step away now from the big leagues and pitching really well. Like, I'm good. And like, this is the first time in my pro career where I'm like, wow, you know, I might be good enough to be in the big leagues. Like, I know people are already talking about, obviously, the Boston media is huge. So they are already talking about possibly, you know, a quick stop in Pawtucket and then to the big leagues because our team's not that good that year. So, you know, obviously, super excited. So I go into there. I'm a closer now for, for AAA, doing really well. And uh, I think I throw, I have one game in, in Pawtucket, throw lights out, and then we go off to Gwinnett um, in Atlanta. It's, it's, it's in Georgia, but it's the AAA team for Atlanta. And didn't have a good one. Didn't have a good one. You know, walked a few guys. Uh, you know, it was, it was one of those outings where you kind of question yourself afterwards. You don't throw so well. And it was my first blown save of my career. So that there was that, too. And after the game, not after the game, the next day, we're at home. And my pitching coach calls me. And Bob Kipper, really, you know, a nice guy. Um... You know, I, 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 I enjoyed playing for Bob. He, he cared about his guys a lot. Uh, but he was a big talker. Loved to dive into things. And unbeknownst to him, and really unbeknownst to me, I was teetering there because I had some walking issues and I wasn't controlling my fastball the way I used to. It wasn't like one of those things where, like, um, I was like, oh, you know, I'm just not, I don't have the feel for it right now. I'm throwing way harder. I'm throwing 96, 99 here in the, out of the bullpen. And I was always a 90, 92 guy from a starting perspective. Had phenomenal control over that. I, even in my own head, I was like, well, you know, I'm not controlling the fastball that great at this level. So I was like, well, you know, I was teetering a little bit. Again, I didn't, unbeknownst to me, unbeknownst to Bob. But we dive in for like 30 or 45 minutes about, my walks and how they hurt. Now, a professional pitcher should be able to hand, should be able to listen to that, hear it, and either go in one year, out the other, or work on something, what have you. In reality, what I really should have done at that time, and would have, I might career probably still be going if I did this, was realize that ninety six to ninety nine was not something that was controllable for me, and I should have went to ninety ninety two ninety three or even ninety two ninety four and controlled the fastball. And I think that right there would have, you know, now early in the at bat, you see a 93 mile an hour fastball controlled, you know, painted. And now you go, oh, one. Now I'm in a good spot now. I can throw my splitter. I can throw 98. I have every, I have things in there. But putting myself in that position first before, you know, all of a sudden now I'm throwing 97. I hope this is a fastball away and it's a strike. But who really knows? Because I'm, I'm, I'm struggling commanding it. So that's what I probably should have done. But what happened? What, ha- what actually happened was the snowball began. Now I was going out there on the mound trying to not walk people, which if you've ever played a baseball or if you've ever really done anything in your life, the moment you try not to do something, you pretty much immediately do that thing. So the snowball starts. In AAA, absolute nightmare. I, I think the year before I had walked uh, like 23 people or something like that in – in like 140 innings, and then that year I walked like 40 guys in 50 innings. It was, you know, obviously not exact numbers, but stupid. And you know, Miranda, pull up the numbers that I had in 2000 um, uh, for people that are watching this on YouTube. But pull up the numbers I had in 2000. Uh, it was 2014 in, in Salem, Virginia, in comparison to 2015 between Portland and and Pawtucket, and you'll see how big of a difference it was for me. Um, so, anyway, terrible year. Hated it. Couldn't wait for it to be done. That summer now, or that that winter, because now I had a tough outing. I go to um, I go to winter ball in Puerto Rico with as the manager Alex Cora, great guy, uh, and we I play there trying to figure it out. They want to see more, obviously. Uh, they want to see that I'm I'm not 
you know, snowballing out of control here and that I can still control the fastball. So they want to see me develop a little before they put me on the 40 man, obviously. So I go. Uh, I'm there with my brother, who's a strength coach at that time for the Diamondbacks. So that was pretty cool. And, you know, we go. And I do, I do okay. Uh, you know, Alex helped me out. Helped me out on not tipping my pitches uh, and, and so forth. But, you know, I do okay. Kind of get it by, but nothing great. And I knew at this time that the snowball was still going, but I was able to kind of slow it down for the time being. So get it done, get put on the 40-man by Boston. Love it. Exciting. Going to spring training that year, first big league camp. Still, still the snowball is, is slowed considerably, but I'm still, it's still not great. I know that all it's going to take is a little bit more of a nudge, and I'm going back at full speed here on the, on the snowball. And so I'm just trying to push it off, just trying to push it off, trying to get better, trying to push it off. First three weeks of the season go great. Get the call up to you know to to Boston, pitch in Atlanta. Uh, you know I walk one guy that at that, that uh, inning, but everything else you know I had a ground ball through the hole. You know I think a little blooper over Xander, and then walk, and then ground ball, ground ball, ground ball, inning over. So it was good. It was a good outing. You know, I, I did. I pitched well. But at the same token, you know I'm in that part where oh I just do this, or if I just do that, this will fix it. This will fix it. This will fix it. It's not how you play the game of baseball. You know, you fix, yeah, of course you're constantly tweaking things and constantly doing things, but I'm no longer tweaking things. I'm now doing things that, you know, changing how I, how I play the game of baseball, and that's not how I should do it. When I should just look back when I'm successful, you know, the whole time yeah, I was talking to mental skills coach and things like that, if I just look back to when I was successful controlling the fastball, what was I doing then? And I was throwing 90, 91, 93, 92, 94. That's when I controlled my fastball at best. Even when I would pop it up to 100, it wasn't always a controlled fastball. That is what I should have done, and that's unfortunate. You know, I'd known that at the time it would have been a lot better, but I didn't. So I go up. I then throw after coming down from Atlanta. I get two months of baseball. Throw, you know, end up complaining to my agent. Why the hell am I not up in the big leagues? We're not even having a good season. Uh, they end up calling me up July third. Pitch horribly against the Angels. That is my infamous story. You know, everyone knows that about that one. And then I go to uh, get sent back down. Month later, get called. Uh, get get a call from uh, Mike Hazen, the assistant GM over in Boston. Actually, I think he is the GM because now Dave Nebraska was president of baseball operations. Just made up titles, and uh, so now I get called and I get, I'm getting traded to Minnesota. Get traded to Minnesota. Life's good. Worst team in baseball. I know I'm going to pitch in the big leagues. Uh, throw really well down in minor leagues. Get called up almost immediately. Pitch the rest of the year in the big leagues. Throw the ball well. Uh, you know, I definitely had some issues with walks. I had the the intentional walk where I I sailed it, which is definitely a result of this whole walking issue. Yeah, I, mean, I never had easy time doing intentional walks because I, I didn't enjoy them. I didn't like having to throw, trying to throw downhill constantly, especially I um, was kind of a max effort guy at the time, trying to throw downhill constantly and then having to not lob it, but like just throw it to my partner weirdly. Out, it was weird. It, it men, messed with my head even when I had great control. So that was kind of a result of a whole bunch of things. But... So I have that issue. And then I still think I would have figured it out there. I was comfortable in Minnesota. Um, and I could have done better. And I was throwing slower. I was throwing like 91, 94 at the time. So I think eventually I would have realized that, you know, just kind of control my body, kind of get back into the groove of things, be able to control the fastball. They end up uh, actually on my flight. I'm at baggage claim, get a call from my agent, realize that they have DFA'd me, designated for assignment, which essentially just means that they um, – Take off, took me off a 40 man. Now every other team has three days or something like that or four days to pick me up, to claim me, and then make a trade for me. Um, and that's exactly what happens. Pittsburgh Pirates claim me. Um, they, uh, you know, take me, you know, take me, put me on their 40 man. I forget what that, I think they probably did cash considerations or a player to be named later or something like that. And uh, so get to Pittsburgh. I'm in Pittsburgh, and the snowball, I can, it's there now. It's there. The, the fastball command's pretty even worse than it used to be. I hate warming up. I didn't like it when I had great control, but I was fine with it. I hated warming up on on-field bullpens because I knew that I, an overthrow, I was only thinking about overthrows, which is like the worst thing you think about. Um, it was just terrible. So I start using my splitter a whole lot more. Me, meanwhile, it's a better pitch. Than I, it's my best pitch that I have. But it's also you know a way to avoid my fastball until 0-2, 1-2 counts where I have a lot of confidence in my fastball. Because I don't have to worry about being a strike anymore. I just got to worry about throwing it hard and hoping that guys make quick reactions and swing at it. So that's what I did. 
That's that's and Pittsburgh didn't like that. I fought with my pitching coach. I fought with the pitching coordinator. Who my pitching coach I like. My pitching coordinator I still think has no idea what the hell he's doing. Um, they Pittsburgh. They have. Thank God they got rid of their old the old guy. They put Ben Sherrington there. I think we'll straighten that place out. But um, it was uh, that was a poorly run organization. Um, it was it, it was not it wasn't good. I think that that organization is a reason why they're three and thirteen this year. I think there's a reason why they've struggled for the past however many years because it's not a well run organization in my opinion in my view. Um, but hopefully Ben's able to straighten it out. I really like Ben, so I think so. But so the snowball's happening. But they they DFA me, and they call me, and the GM tells me I've been traded over to Seattle, and um, I was like, okay. Seattle wanted to put me in the big leagues almost immediately, um, and because I was still pitching the ball well, like a three or in Triple A, like I was doing well. Um, and then, uh, but he tells me the GM for Mid Pittsburgh tells me on the phone that night that hey, they listen like. We, I really hope, you know, we root for you. You're a good guy. Um, it's easier to root for good guys, but I really hope you find your fastball again because I, that's what everyone wants. And I was like, you know, it was denial at one point, but at the same token, like, I understood. You know, I threw 100. If I was throwing 90, no one gives a crap. You know, I pitched with a guy in Seattle, in Tacoma, in AAA, who throws only curveballs. He threw, like, three different types of curveballs. Great guy. He's in the biggest with the Nationals right now. No, cause, but he, his fastball was 88. No one cares about your fastball there. But because I threw 100... Everyone cares about it and wants you to throw that. It's a weapon, and I get that. But I couldn't control it, so it was no longer a viable weapon. <laughs> so I go to Seattle. Um, I throw the first day on the field and absolutely lost control. You know, I'm trying to impress. Don't have faith in my fastball anymore. Don't have faith in anything anymore. Absolutely lose control. And the snowball never stopped from then on. They ended up putting me on the Phantom DL, uh, which I can... Um, you know, I never agreed with. I wanted to keep pitching, but I understood why they did it. I get it. Um, Andy McKay, who's a, the, I think he was the minor league coordinator or the farm director over there. You know, I, I never agreed with his tactics. I think he's a good person, but I never agreed with his tactics. Um, and uh, he put me on the fan DL immediately, which is def- essentially a death sentence. Um, you know, I, he didn't give me a chance like I wanted one. Uh, but it's baseball. That's it's business. That's what happens. So um, that was the end of it, pretty much for me. You know, I, I couldn't throw the fastball anymore. I knew it. Um, I went to big league. I went to. I didn't go to big league camp next year, but I went to minor league camp next year. I threw the ball okay. Um, nothing crazy, but I threw the ball okay. Um, and then uh, I think I would have been released at the end of this end of the uh, spring training. But we had a few guys get hurt in the big league, so they couldn't uh, start the year in AAA. So they needed hit pitchers, so they put me there. And um, I was in uh, Fresno, and I had a lot of confidence in my fastball at the time. I was throwing the ball hard uh, in the bullpen, doing really well, and got sent out there. Started the inning really well. I don't remember exactly how, but started the inning really well. And then the wheels just fell off. Absolutely and utterly fell off. And um, completely in my own head. I don't remember if everything went, anything went like straight to the backstop or not, but like, I couldn't throw a fastball anymore. I knew it. My catcher knew it. My catcher came out and talked to me once. And I was like, dude, I just can't throw a fastball. No clue where it is. Just keep calling splitters. It's the best option we got. So we did, and we didn't get out of the inning. I don't remember if I even recorded an out, but um, it was it was a tough one for me. And it was the, t- the, the worst uh, appearance I've ever had in my career, my last appearance I've ever had in my career. And I remember it was no longer like, damn, man, what can we do to correct this? I remember walking into the dugout um, and I wasn't even mad. I was just defeated. And uh, it was so frustrating because I knew that my career was coming to an end because I couldn't figure this out anymore. I tried for now, 2015 is when this started. This is now 2018. I'm now almost three years in, and I can't correct the mistake, uh, which shows you how, how, how difficult ment- the mentality is and how you can't. This is no longer physical. Physical is easy. But if you lose it mentally, it is almost impossible to... To, to come back and losing that confidence in yourself, having a little bit of anxiety out there while you're out there, like, you know, it, just everything, you know, one, you know, a miss by three inches is like, shit, what am I going to do? And everything becomes a problem. And it was a shame. And I remember my pitching coach who I uh, really liked over in Tacoma came up to me and was just like, hey, when did it go? Not even like, you know, you know, how about this? What about this? It was just like, when did it go, man? And I was like, 
I don't know, man. It's over. And uh, it, it was it was tough. It was it was it was tough. Um, but you know, you had some good guys. You know, I was you know the bullpen guys. You know, helped me out, helped me through it. And then we got home the next day, um, and uh, they you know I'm sitting at my locker, and I knew that one of my guys, Ryan Garten, great dude, uh, really good pitcher. Uh, he w- he was getting sent to AAA the next day. Got a clear room, got a clear room for him, right? So I know I'm on the chopping block. I, I have a feeling that this is it for me. And so I'm sitting at my locker, and my uh, my uh, pitching coach came comes over to me and goes, "Hey man, you know, our manager's name's Pat too." He goes, "Pat wants to see you in his office." And I was like, "This is it." I had never been released up to this point in my career. I'd only been DFA'd or traded, um, but I walked in there and I sat down. And it's usually a very difficult conversation. A lot of times you're 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 making guys' dreams, you know, uh, you know, you pretty much disappear, and uh, and here we are, you know, sitting down. And, and Pat goes, you know, Pat, it, it's time. It, it's it is what it is. You know, we're gonna we're gonna. The, the, I think he said the the organization's going to move in a different direction and it and and you could tell like he was like waiting for my reaction and i was just like i get it man it's it i'm done uh, i was like don't worry about it i knew it was coming and I, i've lost it I, I don't know where it is and i'm not finding it so that is where my career ended but it was a sigh of relief when pat listash told me that i was released it was it was awesome, honestly. It was, you know, I don't have to do this anymore. I don't have to do this thing that has caused me a tremendous amount of anxiety and pain over the last, you know, three years. I'm able to move on. And I went home, tried to figure it out for a little while on my own, see if I could kind of connect with myself. Uh, but it was never there again. And um, I remember about a, after about seven months of trying in the off season, I didn't really get it. I was hoping for, like, just an easy pickup with an independent ball team here in uh, New Jersey close by but then they asked me to go to Florida for a tryout and all that stuff and I was not interested in that um, so I called my agent told my I was going to hang them up and told my parents who still I think struggle with it to this day but you know it is what it is and uh, you know called it quits and it was relaxing I was finally you know I had had one restaurant at the time I was you know on the try you know at that next that summer I would buy a second restaurant um and go back and finish my degree, all that good stuff. And now I live a life that is way less stressful. And I can talk about baseball freely now and watch the game. And, yeah, of course, sometimes I'm like, you know, you know son of a bitch, I wish I could still out, out there. And I think I could still play if I could ever figure out that fastball. And still, if someone told me right now that you can go back, go work out again, you'll have that fastball. And you'll have command over again. I'd go play. I'm 29 years old. Probably still throw 100 if I got it going again. But uh, that's not in the cards for me. So I am living the dream now. But. Uh, it wasn't meant for me to, to play a long big league career, but I still made my dream come true. Um, had a great career, met an awesome, awesome amount of people and, and, and a group of people that I, you know, I still talk to to this day, some of these guys. Um, and the game of baseball has allowed me to, you know, buy those two restaurants and go pursue my other, my next dream, which is, you know, something in media here. I seem to enjoy doing podcasts and stuff like that. So, um, here I am, but uh, it was it was an interesting road and it was a, it was a bumpy one. It wasn't all, you know, fun and games towards the end there. But eventually, we finished. And uh, it, the game, as Scott Boris said, the game of baseball uh, told me that my time was done, and uh, I moved on. But that is the rise and fall of of, of the great career that is Pat Light. And um, appreciate you guys tuning in. Appreciate you listening. You know, go follow us on Twitter. Sorry, we're closed. This is episode 11. Uh, we got another guest coming uh, on episode 12. You're gonna wanna listen to that one. It's a, it's it's a it's a great you know former Sox guy, um, a guy that I think you all really enjoy. So uh, make sure you tune into that. But until then, go follow me on Twitter, Instagram. Also, go you know go look at my YouTube page. Uh, follow me there. I'm trying to build that a little bit. Trying to do some more vlogging, some more things over there. I think with the bar scene and all that good stuff. So. Um, go follow me over there as well. Uh, and until next time, guys, I will uh, I'll talk to you later. See you at the bar. Mm-hmm.